eventually, if you keep asking me questions, I'll have to cut you off, but I don't think anyone will need to. I think you'll find, I, Alex will agree that, she, that the, the exam's pretty reasonable. Um, it's easier than the homework. Okay, um, so we're on phases today. I didn't really know how I wanted to tackle this today um, because I don't really want to spend a lot of time kind of talking about phase diagrams and all that kind of BS that you learn in intro chem. Uh, but I think we should go over it a little bit because it's useful. Um, and I want to talk more about, I want to step away from some of the exotic stuff we talked about, the idea of a second order phase transition, these continuous phase transitions that we talked about with supercritical fluids and magnetism. I don't really want to talk about that today. Instead, I want to look at first order phase transitions. I want to look at the classics. The classic phase transitions. that pretty much every material goes through, which of course is the liquid, the solid, solid to gas, or liquid to gas, and the, the ever present, but increasingly, or somewhat rare, solid to gas transition as well. Right, which we call sublimation. All right, and what, what I kind of want to talk about today is is the idea of, of building a phase diagram, right? And I'll draw a phase diagram in a minute. I'm sure you've seen one before. And I want to talk about how you draw, how you, how you come up with one, right? We often see phase diagrams. Let me give you an example of one. So for instance, for benzene, I will try that to phase diagrams. I'm going to try to approximate the phase diagram of benzene. And a traditional phase diagram is, is one where you measure temperature of your substance versus the pressure. And the example I want to use today, the pressure's in Tor and the temperature's in Kelvin. We're going to do this for benzene C6H6. And I'm, I'm going to just kind of draw a graph here of what it looks like. And we, I want to talk a little bit about the, the features and the characteristics of this. So let me uh, define some points. So this phase diagram will start at 250 Kelvin. Middle point will be 285. And we'll move it up to 320 here. And then we'll look at pressure kind of on the order. Uh, I don't really have a lot of pressures here, but we'll just do about 50 here in the middle. And what we're going to look at is, is Imagine that we sit, imagine that we, f we, we move our, our, our mixture, we have, we have a sample of benzene, and we set T and P so that delta G between two phases is zero. All right, so, so we have a perfect equilibrium between the two phases. And what I want to draw is, as we move across temperature and pressure, what does the equilibrium line look like as we adjust T and P so that delta G is always equal to zero, right? So the idea is, is imagine that we're, we're at liquid and solid, right, for, for benzene. We get it to the point where it's right between liquid and solid and they're equilibrium between the two. Delta G is zero between those two. And then I want to adjust the temperature Maybe I want to heat it up or warm it up. How do I change the pressure so that delta G becomes zero again? So let me give you an example. All right, so let's say, for instance, we, we start at this point right here. And we say, OK, delta G, we, count, we measure delta G here is equal to zero between two phases. Whichever one they are, we're not, I'm not sure yet, but between two phases. And I want to adjust temperature 
right? And I want to make sure I want to conserve delta g equals zero, right? I want to keep on the equilibrium, right? So as I heat it up or warm it up, how does pressure how does pressure need to change in order to keep that equilibrium between the two phases? Right? We call these phase coexistence lines. So lines in PT space where delta G is equal to zero between two phases are called phase coexistence lines. Right? And the idea is, is that right, all we're asking is, is imagine that this is where, where benzene, liquid benzene freezes out. Right? It freezes out. It goes to solid. Right? So what pressure, at a given temperature, what pressure does, at a given pre the ask is, is you draw a line and ask, well, what pre at a given temperature, what pressure does benzene freeze? Right? So how does that freezing point change as a function of temperature and pressure? All right, and what you find is that when you, um, if you've done the um, the the two phase, the two component mixture solid liquid or was it liquid solid phase diagram lab, in PCHEM you've already done this, um, and the idea is exactly the same. There you're looking for, as a function, rather in that case you're looking as a function of concentration and temperature where it freezes out. But here we just have a pure system, right? We just have pure benzene, so we we don't have to worry about concentration. We just need temperature and pressure. And what you find is that if you plot these coexistence lines out, it starts and looks something like this. So you have this line here where the co this is the coexistence. Basically, this is everything below this line is gas. And then there you find that there's another branch around this point right here where there's another coexistence line like this, which separates the solid part and the liquid part. Okay. Right, so the idea is, is that you, this is a nice easy, this is a, if you had this graph for you, you could calculate where benzene freezes out at any pressure you want. Right? If you have liquid benzene and you want to, and you're at a given pressure, you can calculate the temperature at which uh, liquid benzene freezes out the solid by looking at where this line falls as a function of temperature. Interestingly, there's a point here where all three coexist simultaneously. Right? We can sit right there. If we set our pressure and our temperature right there, depending on which direction we go, we can get e any of the three phases. Right? Right? And this is a course called the triple point. And every, every material, every pure material, or every pure chemical, has exactly one triple point. So there's, a, there's, always a, there's always a point. You can look at any material you want, water, benzene, ethane, whatever you want, helium. There's always a point where solid, liquid, and gas meet. And what we'll do is we'll actually prove that. And we'll be able to come up with a rule that shows that there's always going to be a point where all three coexist simultaneously. Now there's some questions that we should ask. First of all, let's, let's just ask some questions here. Questions. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about these for a little bit. What determines the slope of the coexistence lines? Right, if we look at this, this graph carefully, notice that as a function of temperature, the gas liquid or the, let's say the gas condensed line, this, this one right here, this big long one, always has a positive slope as a function of temperature. Right? However, if we look at the solid liquid line, the line's different, right? It, it's pointing this way. Right? So there must be something different between these two right? that determines this, this slope. And we'll, and we'll find out that there's a thermodynamic reason for that. Right? 
So that's one thing. Another thing is, is all real, real gases have a critical point. So at some temperature and pressure, the coexistence line between gas and liquid must disappear. It's not really a question, more of a comment or an observation. Right. We showed that, right? Remember the critical point, we look at the Van der Waals gas, if you're below that critical point, there's liquid and gas coexistence, right? Which means that this link, this sign, this curve exists. But it, once you get above that critical point, the line disappears. There's no more coexistence. You just have one fluid, right? This supercritical fluid. Right? So in fact, this line doesn't extend for infinity. There's got to be some point that it ends. Right? And at that point, everything on the outside beyond this is just one fluid, right? Liquid and solid, or liquid and gas. Uh, continue to coexist. Right, so this is the critical point. Now interestingly, you may also ask the question, well, the gas in the liquid point ends sometime. What about the solid liquid point? And it turns out, just right, this is, a, let's say, questions and observations. Solid Liquid never has a critical point. All right, and we'll try to explore why that is. All right, so there's never a pressure or a temperature where the difference between a liquid and a solid disappears. Right? That, that line basically continues for infinity, right? You go all the way up in pressure, 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 pressure keep going higher and higher and higher and higher up this diagram, and this line continuously coexists. Right. But however, the liquid and the gas one ends. Right. And we showed that with the Van der Waals gas. So there's a critical point. But solid and liquid don't have it, doesn't have a critical point, right. which, is, which is somewhat interesting. OK, so what I, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the kind of quantitative, this idea of a phase diagram, and what we can learn from it. Interestingly, I'm just going to write this as kind of a note. This is a nice thing to know. Maybe you already do know this. Is that you implicitly know the triple point of a material always. So there is a very common known triple point. And that's for water. And typically what the water the water the water triple point is defined at 273.15 Kelvin, approximately 1.0 bar. Right? This this freezing point that you know and love for water, zero Celsius and one bar, is the triple point of water. In fact, we'll, we'll look at the we'll look at the water phase diagram shortly, right? And and, and in fact, you're, you're in if you were to if you were to take water at the triple point, right, right at the freezing point, and then evacuate it, right? Evacuate the cylinder or whatever your container is of air, drop the pressure at the triple point, your water would magically go into gas. That's one of the nice things about water is that you can get liquid water, solid water, and gaseous water, water vapor, at a very reasonable temperature and pressure. Right? You don't have to go very far from room, at, room temperature, well not room temperature, but zero Celsius, ice temperature, and room pressure to get any of the phases of water. Right? That's one of the amazing things about water. And well, that's probably the reason why we exist in a and you can argue that's the reason why humans probably exist on an Earth that, that sits around this temperature because we're, we're close to the right H2O kind of acts normally in that region. Right? It's useful. There's the vapor, solid, and liquid for us. Right? So it's somewhat that's a coincidence, I suppose, our existence. Right? Of course, if we were 
perhaps if we were benzene based, we would be at a completely different, right? We wouldn't exist here. If our, if our, if our body was majority benzene, we would be um, in a much colder environment with much lower pressure if we wanted to exist with liquid benzene in our blood. That would not be very lovely. Okay, so, so we have some things to think about, right? We've got to think about the slope of these coexistence lines, right? How do we measure them, right? What's a, how do we predict the slope of these lines? Okay, how do we determine them? Of course, you can do it empirically. You can just take a sample and just switch the pressure and the temperature and see where they, where they pace change and make it yourself. But there's got to be some physical interpretation to the slopes of these lines. And also, we've already talked about it, but there's always going to be a critical point. And we have to think about why there's no critical point for a solid and a liquid. Now, here's an interesting question. Another thing that I've mentioned is that there's only one triple point. And it turns out, and not only that, not only that, there's no way to have anything more than three phases coexist at one point. Let me give you an example. I know I have a good graph here for that. Right, so let's, let's pretend, uh, where can I erase? Let's erase over here. Let's come up, I'm going to just come up with a made up, I'm just going to fabricate a phase diagram. And let's see, we can actually talk about whether it's physically valid or not. Okay, so we have one component, so it's just a pure substance, as your te temperature per pressure, and I'm just going to draw some lines. Right, maybe we measure, maybe we think a phase, the phase diagram of something we're going to measure looks like this. Maybe I should shift this down a little bit. It's not the best drawing in the world, but it, it'll do the trick. All right, so in some ways, each, each little area that's sub, subdivided by these lines is a specific phase. So let's just label them. All right, let's call this phase alpha. Maybe this is phase, this is beta inside of this little region right here. Maybe this is delta. Here's epsilon, and here's gamma. Okay, we have five different phases for this theoretical diagram. Okay, what, whether they're solid, liquid, or gas is irrelevant. Right? We're not worried about that. But rather, I'm just going to ask the question: Is this a valid phase diagram? And the answer we'll find out is no. And there's a very simple rule to determine whether a phase diagram is valid or not. And this rule is named after our friendly Josiah Gibbs of New Haven, Connecticut. The Gibbs phase rule. And we won't prove this here, but the proof of this is actually quite simple. And what, what Gibbs says, Gibbs writes down is this formula, and I'm just going to write it in terms of symbols, and then we'll describe the symbols as we go down, as we go through it, is that the number of degrees of freedom in your phase diagram, F, is equal to the number of components in your mixture minus the number of phases plus 2. Right. So let me write that down, and we'll des I'll describe what each of these are. So F is the number of degrees of freedom. C is the number of components in your mixture. Right, right now we're only talking about pure, so C is always one, pure substances. And P is the number of coexisting phases. So now I've got to describe what a degree of freedom is in this case. 
So let's go back to the, let's use this form, let's, before we get to our, our fabricated phase diagram, let's look at it in terms of the benzene diagram. All right, so for benzene, C is one. So if C is one, which is a pure substance, this simplifies to F equals, uh, uh, sorry, so the phase is so C is one. Uh, sorry, so three equals three equals three minus p. Okay, so what is a degree of freedom? Well, a degree of freedom. Imagine that we we we're at a point here. Okay, so let's say we're we're at this point in the phase diagram. Our temperature and pressure is sitting right there in the middle of the liquid phase. How many degrees of freedom we have? Well, that's how many variables we have to choose that we can move through the phase diagram. So the degree, number of degrees of freedom is the idea of how many variables can you change so that you, you maintain the phase that you're in, if you will, or the position that you're in. And so in, in, in the case of liquid, we have one phase, right? So we're in the pure liquid. There's nothing but liquid. So P is 1. So F is 2. So if we're in a region of one phase and C is equal to one, right, pure, pure, a, a pure mixture, just one, one component, then F is equal to two. What that means is, is that there are two variables we can change independently to move through the phase diagram, right? And that's pretty straightforward because one of the degrees of freedom is a long temperature, and another one is a long pressure. Right? So the degrees of freedom in this case are temperature and pressure. Right? So that says that in order to maintain, as long as we're in a, as long as we're to maintain the, to stay in the region that we are in pure liquid form in a single pure phase, that means we can we can move two variables and, and stay in that phase. Right? We can move temperature and pressure. We can move up, up or down, left or right, and still stay in the phase, right? right? Still be able to move through this, this liquid part of the diagram. Okay, so what about, what if we're on a coexistence line? So what if we're here instead? Okay, so in that place, Then we have four, we have two phases, right? We have, at, at this point, the system is equal is e an equilibrium between solid and liquid. Both exist on this at this point. So P is equal to two, right? Which means F is equal to one, right? So in order to stay along the coexistence line. We can only move along one variable and fix the other. So if we always want to stay along this coexistence line, we either have to move pressure and then temperature changes, right? Move pressure, then the temperature has to decrease along this line, right? Or we can move temperature and then we're saying this line pressure has to change, right? Pressure and temperature are related to each other along the line, right? So on a coexistence line, P and T are not independent. They're dependent on each other, right? If we move both of them, right? If I move temperature and then I move pressure some way, we're going to leave that line. Right, so if I move temperature this way, right, pressure has to decrease. But what if I increase pressure? Right, if I, so if I move this way in temperature, so if I move this way in temperature, right, then pressure has to decrease accordingly in order to stay on a coexistence line. But if I move, if I move temperature this way and then increase pressure, well, then I'm here. Now I'm in one phase. 
right? So the coexistence goes away. All right, so a line, these coexistence lines are limit how you can change the thermodynamic variables, prep temperature and pressure in this case, in order to maintain that equilibrium between both phases. There's one more case, which is here at the triple point. Right? Here, three phases coexist equally. So the degrees of freedom is zero. Right? There's just one point. If I move temperature or I move pressure, I'm off the, the, degree, off the triple point. So if, uh, let's see if I have some place to put this. Yeah, I'll put it over here at triple point. F is zero, so triple point is a point. It exists at only one temperature and pressure, right? There's right, one specific temperature and pressure. Okay? So any phase di any valid phase diagram has to satisfy this, right? And that, that, that in some ways that proves that there can only be one triple point. Because in order for there to be one triple point, I'm oh, sorry, in order for there to be more triple points, then you have to have more degrees of freedom than zero. If the degrees of freedom are zero, well, then there's only one point it can be at. So a pure system, a pure, mic, a pure component, a pure chem a chemical, will always just have one triple point, right, by this rule. Okay, so now let's go look at this, this fabricated phase diagram that I have here. So we can we can look and, and, and so if we can and then we along every, at every point we can calculate f and as long as f is greater than zero then we're okay right if f is minus is negative right if p is greater than three for a pure system f is minus one for instance right if, if p is four then that's not physical right you can have negative degrees of freedom you can either have zero which is a point you can have one which is a line or two which is a plane. Right, so let's look at this phase diagram. Right, so these lines seem reasonable. Right, these can be reasonable coexistence lines. Right, so I'll just draw them. These all look okay. Right, you can calculate along those coexistence lines that F is 1, right, because they coexist between two phases. This point right here is a triple point. F is 0 at that point. But notice at this point, I'm going to draw it in a different color between gamma, epsilon, and beta. Here, how many phases are coexisting? Four. Delta, beta, epsilon, and gamma. Four phases coexist at this point. So P is four, so F is minus one, which means that this is not physical. This is not possible. Right? The only way you can have a quadruple point is if, for instance, you have multiple components. Right? Let's say if you have a mixture, a binary mixture, C is 2, so then F is going to be 4 minus P, right? So for a mixture, you can have a quadruple point where four phases coexist simultaneously. So for pure substances, at most, three phases coexist simultaneously. No more, no less. Well, okay, so no, it's definitely less. You have two phases coexist or one phase. But you can't have more than three phases, right? So any sort of pure substance cannot have a phase diagram like this, right? So if you ever, I don't know why this would ever be given to you, but if anyone says, Here, here's a phase diagram, and you can just tell them it's bullshit because there's a quadruple point for a pure substance, which is impossible. Right? Questions about this so far? 
little bit at the slopes of these lines. I'm going to go ahead and put Gibbs phase rule over here, just so we have it. If I can erase it right here. So let's let's sit along. Let's imagine we have some substance in a container, right, and we're sitting on a coexistence line. The idea is that these curves, the coexistence curves, or the coexistence lines, tell us a lot, I'm going to say it very generically, about the relationship of, let's say, boiling points and, and Phase, phase transition properties, like boiling points, melting points, right. and so let's look at let's look at the phase diagram for for water. So this is for H2O. Pressure versus atmosphere. Let me write some numbers down. Zero atmospheres. 0.05. Somewhat like this, and so let's look. So, so what, what this, what the temperature at a given point along these curves tells us is these are the boiling points. Let's just assign this is solid, this is liquid, and this is gas, right? and these are the freezing points. Right? And the interesting thing that you can, you can derive from this is that if we look at the freezing point as a function of pressure, the boiling point as a function of pressure, right, what we immediately notice is that the boiling point is very dependent on pressure. Right? So let's look at an example here. Right? So if we look at kind of the base of the triple point, right, which is at 273.15, and we increase the pressure a little more, and the boiling point jumps up to almost 350 Kelvin, right? We've gone from this point, barely moved pressure at all, we've come up here. But if you look at the freezing point, or the melting point, however you like to look at it, is much less sensitive on pressure. And this should make sense, right? If you think about the entropy change, as you go from a long, right? If we think about entropy, right? If we think about how the entropy of a substance as a function of temperature goes, that again is going to be the standard entropy, some standard, plus the integral of the heat capacity divided by temperature T. In general, 
the heat capacity for gas is much less smaller than the heat capacity for a liquid. It's much less smart. Sorry, let me change that again. Sorry, excuse me. That's not right. Okay, so we know the heat capacity for a gas is much greater than the heat capacity for a liquid. Much less great, which is much greater than the heat capacity for a solid. All right, so as you start to heat, heat the system. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so as you start to heat the system up as a function of temperature, right? you go up the temperature, the gas absorbs quite a bit more energy as entropy, right? Because CP is much larger here, right? So as you integrate over CP, delta S is much larger for a gas at a given temperature, right? So at then than it would be for a solid, right? So as you absorb energy. Larger and larger amounts of that energy, as you raise the temperature, lots of that energy is getting pushed into entropy. Right? So in order to, right, which means that as entropy increases, in order to make sure delta G is zero, right? Remember delta G is zero at this point on these lines, along the entire line. Right? So in order, in order to compensate for the increase of internal entropy, you need to pump the temperature up to get delta G well up to zero, right? So the, the, the effect of heat capacity dominates capacity dominates in a gas or liquid, in a gas compared to liquid or a solid. So to maintain delta G equals zero, you need to increase the temperature more as a function of pressure. Right, so the idea is, is that Right, the gas, the, the gas, for instance, if we're sitting in liquid in the gas coexistence line, the, the temperature is increasing, the gas can soak up a lot of that energy as heat capacity. So in order to maintain delta G equals zero, you need to increase T as well to compensate. Right, so the slope of this is quite a bit more dr dramatic. Right, you have more increase, this increases, sorry, there's more curvature here than you would expect for a solid or liquid. For a solid, heat capacity is much smaller so as you increase the temperature or the pressure, the, the delta G doesn't change nearly as much. So then that means that the, the, the freezing point as a function of pressure doesn't change nearly as much as it would for a gas. So, right, because delta S doesn't change, the entropy change of the system is much smaller for solid or across the solid liquid boundary than it is for the liquid gas. So in order to compensate, you have, you have less temperature need to compensate as you increase the pressure. That's kind of a strange argument for that. But it will start to make sense very readily. If we look at, this if we look at a phase diagram, phase coexistence in a slightly different way. All right, so let's, let's remind ourselves, we talked about this last class, that the derivative of Gibbs with respect to temperature is minus the entropy. Okay. So what we can do is look at for, let's say for benzene or whatever, some molecule, a plot of Gibbs energy for, the phase trans for, for a phase as a function of temperature. 
Okay, and so let's start with the solid liquid. So we'll do C6H6 solid to liquid coexistence. Right, and so as temperature, as of course, as temperature increases, entropy increases. So the slope of this curve is negative. Right, S of so ds dt is zero is greater than zero by the second law. So dg dt has to be less than zero. Right, which means the slope is negative. This one, this one's dead completely. Let me get another black marker real quick. Uh, bless you. And let's also make a note that this entropy of a solid is less than the entropy of a liquid. It's less than the entropy of a gas. Right, of course, a gas is more disordered than a liquid, and liquids are more disordered than a solid. Right, so that would mean then that the slope of G versus T for a solid will be more shallow than it is for a liquid, and more shallow it is for a gas. Right, they're going to become more steeper. The, the slope of G versus T is going to be steeper as we go from solid to liquid to gas. Right, so for, for benzene, I think the solid-liquid transition is at 279 Kelvin. Is that right? Double check, I have that number here somewhere in my, in my papers. Oh, it's over here, excuse me, sorry. Yeah, 279. All right, so this is the melting point of benzene. And of course, the so, so the so entropy of the solid is less, so it's going to have a fairly shallow curve that's negative. Solid. And of course, there's a discontinuity. It's a first order phase transition. This is a first derivative, so it's discontinuous at the phase transition by definition. So the liquid changes slope immediately like this. Likewise, we can we can draw we can extend this graph. Even further, there at 350, which is where the boiling point is. Let me make these even flatter real quick, so just to, so I have a little extra space. Now, this is liquid, this is gas. We can also look at can also look at the Gibbs energy as a function of pressure. Of course, because because the because the entropy for a solid changes much more slowly as a function of pressure or temperature than a liquid or a gas, and G, DGDP is equal to at constant pressure is equal to the molar volume. We can say, well, okay, well, what's the molar volume? Well, the molar volume of a gas, of course, is going to be much larger than the molar volume of a liquid, which is much greater than the molar volume of a solid. Right? They become more and more condensed as we go. Right? And so that also helps us determine the, uh, 
excuse me, it helps us determine the slope, the slopes of Gibbs with respect to pressure as well, right? So at low pressure, gas should exist first, right? Gas is here. And then we have liquid and solid, right? As you pressurize a system at constant pressure or constant temperature, it's going to go from gas to solid or gas to liquid to solid. All right, so the gas slope, I'll draw it in a different color, is going to be very sharp. And then for the liquid, it's going to, right, the more volume of the liquid is, is smaller, so the slope is lower. And then for a solid, again, the molar volume is minimum, so it might just flatten out right, like that. All right, so the idea is, the idea is that G, Gibbs, is increasingly less dependent on pressure and temperature as we condense our material right so if the gibbs free energy is let me write the gibbs free energy therefore the coexistence lines where delta G is equal to zero, right? The Gibbs energy difference between liquid and solid or liquid and gas is zero. Become increasingly less dependent on the uh, degrees of freedom as our material increasingly condenses from gas to liquid to solid. Okay, so that's why, just in a quick drawing, I'll just redraw the benzene diagram or any of them this, let me draw that less obvious, something like this. That's why it's a function of temperature and pressure. Right, these lines are where delta G is equal to zero, where delta G equals zero is conserved. That's why when you go between the less condensed phases, or again I'll write this as gas, this is liquid, and this is solid. And when we go between two highly less condensed phases, Right, where the entropy change is greater, we have a strong dependence between temperature and pressure of coexistence. Right. Strong dependence on T and P. But when we go to systems where the entropy is much lower, right, where the slope of, of Gibbs with respect to temperature or pressure is much smaller, right, for solid, or solid, right, they're flat, then the line, the, the, the dependence on the boiling point or the melting point is much weaker. Right, effectively, it's a straight line, right? So if you take if you take if you take solid if you take solid benzene, pressurize the bejesus out of it, and figure out what temperature it melts at, it doesn't really change that much. But when you do that for the gas, it changes a lot. And we'll, we'll learn more about that once we get to a, a few more ideas. Um, but that's the basic gist of it. Right? That, that entropy ultimately entropy is what drives entropy is what drives the dependence of phase coexistence on our so-called degrees of freedom, right? Our variables, temperature, pressure, so on and so forth, right? So for systems, for components or phases where the entropy is quite small. Right? You have very little dependence on the coexistence line, the delta G equals zero line, on those, co on those components, right? on T or P, those degrees of freedom. But for the system where you have very large entropy, right? like a gas or very highly disordered systems, you're going to have a strong dependence 
on TMP because the entropy change as a function of those variables is large. Right. So one of the kind of a, a take home point I want to say, how much time do we have? Oh, good, we have some time. I want to show you some pretty pictures before we go too. Um, a, really, a really nice thing to, to think about, and you've probably seen this, so uh, phase, phase transitions occur Again, when delta G is equal to zero, a really nice way to write that is, is that at along a phase coexistence line, delta H is equal to, uh, sorry, let me think about this. Uh, sorry, let me think about that again. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Delta S is equal to delta H over T right. at the coexistence, at, at, at the transition point. Right, because, because you have delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S equals zero, which means delta H is equal to T delta S, or however you want to write that, right? Or delta S is equal to delta H over T. So the nice thing about this equation is that you can predict the sign of enthalpy for your phase transition as long as you can rationalize the entropy change. Right? So for instance, so let's go for instance, solid to liquid. Right? You're going from an ordered to a disordered state. Delta S is greater than zero, right? Just by intuition, going from ordered to disordered, delta S is eight greater than zero, which means that melting is endothermic, right? The system has to absorb energy to do transit to transition, so endothermic. All right? You can think about it another way, right? Another way to think about it is. In order to take a solid and turn it into a liquid, you need to break all of those strong bonds between the molecules in the solid, which means you've got to pump energy into the system. So the system will absorb energy. Thus, entropy has to be greater than zero. Right? You can think of it either way, whichever is easier. Right? But it's a really easy way to, to remember these things, that when you go from an ordered to a disordered phase in a first, in a first order phase transition, it has to be endothermic because you're disordering the system. And of course, that's the case also for liquid and ga liquid to gas. Right? Delta S is greater than zero. Delta H is greater than zero. And so they're always, they always have the same sign. Right? And that's a really easy way to remember it. So it's either whether you can think about, it about ordering or disordering. The reason why I bring this up is because yesterday I was talking about this in, in the other section. Um, and I kept forgetting if melting was endothermic or exothermic. But it's always easy to remember if you think about it in terms of how the ordering is changing, how the entropy changes, go from ordered to disordered or vice versa, then you always know the sign of delta H. So, and again, physically you can think of that as break, you have to break these strong bonds, these intermolecular attractions, which means you pump energy into the system. Likewise, if you go backwards, say you condense the gas, you're taking a gas which has very little attraction into a liquid that has strong attractions, which means the energy is going to lower in the system, which means it's going to be exothermic, right? You're ordering the system so delta H is less than zero. It has to release energy, right? So just, as, just some notation, right? We often call solid the liquid fusion. Actually, we call that melting, <laughs> which is delta S greater than zero, delta H greater than zero. Liquid to solid is called fusion. Delta S is less than zero, delta H is less than zero. And of course, liquid to gas is called boiling. 
or vaporization, we'll call it vaporization. I think that's the scientific term for it. Delta S is greater than zero, delta H is greater than zero. And of course, gas, the liquid, is condensation. Delta S is less than zero, delta H is less than zero. And then there's, of course, solid to, solid to gas, which is called sublimation. And delta H here is much, much greater than zero. Delta H is much, much greater than zero as well. All right, so you can often look up in the books, and we'll have problems with this, of course, where I'll, we'll talk about the enthalpies of fusion and melting and vaporization. You've probably heard all these terms before. So just as a reminder what each of these are. Right, so the idea is, is that phase diagrams are determined by entropy. Right? Entropy ultimately determines the shape and the size of these phase diagrams. And the amazing thing is, is that in general, almost all pure phase diagrams look almost exactly identical. Right, the only thing that changes are the values of T and P where the coexistence lines exist. The presence of these lines are guaranteed. They're universal. Every pure substance roughly has a structure that looks like this. The actual position in terms of temperature and pressure is dependent on the material. Right, of course, the helium one's going to look a lot different than the water one. And the iron one, of course, looks a lot different than either of them. Right, but the idea is, is the idea of solids, liquids, and gas, it's all about entropy. It's all about Gibbs. And, and, the, and the, the curvature of these things in general are pretty much universal. It's just the shape and the size and where the critical points are and stuff depends on the material. There are exceptions, though. So what I'm going to show you here at the end of, once I get this green on, it turned off. I just want to show you for the last couple minutes um, that this idea of that there are, in a pure substance, there are only three phases, three well-defined phases, is 100% not true. What we're going to find is, that in fact, there are different solid phases and liquid, different, di different liquid phases. It's not really different gas phases, but they're different solid phases in particular. And there's a really, really great example of that. Right, so here, right here, I'm sorry, get this on. Is the this is the phase diagram for water. And again, the water diagram doesn't look all that interesting. We have a liquid gas coexistence line right here. Looks just like we always have. And then we have a pretty much vertical solid to liquid phase coexistence line, right? right? Because the entropy is change is not that great along the solid line. So it's pretty much straight up. But notice, notice something weird happens at high pressure, right? So this is at very high pressure. Right? So here's the, the triple point right here. Freeze, oh, sorry, sorry. The, the, the freezing point, 273.15. Here's the triple point. Sorry, it's at 611 pascals. I apologize. Not one bar. It's a little lower. This is where we exist in this region right here. STP. Right, and so everything, if you, if you cut the line, if you cut it off right here and look at everything below that, well, that cutoff point, it looks exactly like what I've drawn right here. But when you look at water, and this is, this is a continuing research project for, for um, there have been new developments in, in this over the years, even in the last couple years, is that as you go through the solid part of the water phase diagram, there are multiple, multiple solid, solid phase changes. There are many, many kinds of ice, right? The ice we know and love is what's called ice of H ice, hexagonal ice, H for hexagonal, and I'll show you why it's hexagonal. If you, take, if you take that ice and continue to cool it more and more and more to wherever this is, about minus 75 here Celsius, ice changes structure. There's an entire structural change where it goes to a cubic 
crystal structure. You could keep cooling it even more, getting closer to liquid nitrogen temperatures, and another phase change exists, and you form orthorhombic. And then also, but if you take normal old ice that you know and love, you put in your drink, and you pressurize it, it undergoes multiple phase changes. There are multiple phase ice phases. So, and this is one of the amazing things about water, is that due to the hydrogen bonding of water, there are multiple highly energetically favorable configurations for those hydrogen bonds to arrange in different orientations, which change the structure of a water crystal, and you get entirely different solid phases. Right? These are first order phase transitions between solid and solid. Right? Not every, now, some, some liquids, for instance, benzene, have very few solid phases. I think benzene has two or three. It might only have one. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Hydrogen, for instance, has, people have looked at solid hydrogen, and there's predicted, for instance, if you pressurize hydrogen enough, solid hydrogen forms a metal. You can form metallic hydrogen at very high pressure. So there's a predicted solid-solid phase transition from solid hydrogen to metallic hydrogen. Right, so even for simple molecules, the, the solid diagrams are somewhat complicated. But water in particular is really complicated, right? There are, if you count, I think there are 12, 11 or 12 phases, no, 15 phases of water on this diagram, right? Here's XV, 15, right? So water undergoes many, many different structural changes. So there are many, many different phase transitions at high pressure and low temperature uh, for water, right? They're not all just, they're not all just one general phase. And so here are some pictures of it. In fact, there's 18 of them. They're not all shown on that figure. Some of them have been discovered recently. All right, so this is the, this is the ice you know and love, all right, hexagonal ice. Bless you. All right, and as you cool it, if you can super cool your water, or if you go to Jupiter, for instance, um, or some of Jupiter's moons, you can find what's called cubic ice. Right? That's at normal pressures, kind of normal, reasonable pressures at very low temperature. Um, you can find cubic ice. It has a very different infrared spectrum than hexagonal ice. That's how they usually detect these things, is they have different uh, infrared spectra, distinct, distinct OH stretches. Right? And there's many other types of ice, right? You can have these ordered hexagonal ices, where you have in the unit cell an additional kind of ones that are sticking off the side. Like this, you have this rhombohedral ice, where you form these beautiful concentric rings that form a, a, a rhombus. If you, if you draw the lines here along the unit cell, you get a nice four-dimensional quadrilateral. Right? It's a different structure than this hexagonal ice. Right? This is the reason why you always have that hexagonal symmetry in snowflakes, because the, you, the unit structure of ice, crystal ice, regular crystal ice is hexagonal. So when you create a large-scale crystal, it, it, it uh, What's the word I'm looking for? When you form a, a large-scale crystal, a crystal of many units of hexagonal ice, you, you preserve that hexagonal symmetry. Right? So you can imagine if we, were, if we were cold enough, our snowflakes would be cubic. They would be squares. Right? Or they would be, romb they'd be rhombuses. Right? So the, the snowflakes on other planets look entirely different because water has all these different, different types of solid phases. In fact, this is this is new. This is not. This is actually fairly novel. Here's the the most recent phase diagram. This is from last year. Right. This is from a paper that discovered the 18th. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Notice that the pressures are in hundreds of gigapascals. Right. This is tons of pressure. Uh, so an atmosphere is 100,000 pascals. That's 100 kilopascals. So this is uh, a million a million times more pressure than atmosphere, a million atmospheres. Right? And there's, there's this new 18th one that exists right here, right there at, the high, at high temperature and high pressure, 18th, up here. Right? And this paper's from that. I think they have a nice picture of it. Right? You can see it's very complicated, right? There's many different phases. They have different entropy contributions that lead to different curves, right? This, the phase, the, the the slopes of these are all over the place, right? There's very, very complicated entropy going on, very complicated intermolecular interactions. And that's due to the fact that these hydrogen bonds um, of water are so complex, they're so strong, and they can dominate at low t temperature and high pressure, they can dominate the physics. Um, and lots of weird things can happen when you have these kind of high, strong intermolecular interactions.
So here's a picture of it. Here's ice 19. Okay, so actually, so there are 19 now. I said the number gets bigger every slide. Um, so this was discovered this year, right? It's got this, it, it's kind of hard to, to show this. It's kind of weird, but in, in normal ice, in normal ice, you have every unit of ice, every subunit of the ice looks exactly the same. But in this complex ice, there are two distinct units that are stacked, that are tessellated together in a pattern, right? Which is why they color them in different ones. It's kind of hard to see the difference between the two, but it's just the orientations of the hydrogens are different between these two. But they're conserved in these five unit groups. But it's really weird because in this ice, you don't have hexagonal, right? You don't have this nice hexagon, which is a really natural, uh, natural geometry for molecules. You have these weird cubes with a, a molecule of water stuck inside, right? These are extremely, extremely high pressures. You're compressing the crap out of the water. And so in order to relieve that strain, they end up making these really weird structures where you end up, basically you form a cavity and you stick a water inside of that cavity. So you get these really, really complex structures. I can't even imagine what a snowflake of this looks like. It must be absurd. Um, but it does, have, it does have square symmetry though. Right? So these would be cubic snowflakes if you were to form one. And this is another one that's very similar, I6. This, uh, this exists, do they have a I19 yet, right? So this is, this is the one they formed. This actually tells you how they do it. And what they do is they take liquid water, they pressurize it at isothermal conditions, and then they do an isobaric cooling. They go through I6, which again has that similar kind of square-like structure. And you can see that they're very similar to each other. Right? And, they, and then they cool it down to 19. Right? And what happens is that the structure slightly deforms in order to relieve the strain. There's not enough entropy in the system for it to straighten out, like here. And so the whole thing kind of crinkles inward, like you're crushing it. Okay? So you get this kind of weird offset um, uh, square-like structure. Right? So it's like, it's like here it has some room to breathe. And the pressure and the temperature is so high and so low, there's no entropy left for the system to wiggle. There's no internal energy left. The whole system starts to crush in on itself. Right? And you get this weird structure. Right? So water is really, really special because of that, because of its hydrogen bonds. Right? Benzene's, benzene's high pressure ice diagram does not look nearly as interesting as this. And that's because, of course, benzene doesn't really interact with itself very strongly. Right? Benzene, benzene. Uh, intermolecular attraction is on the order of maybe 8 kilojoules per mole and a hydrogen bond is on the order of 50 to 100 kilojoules per mole. So it's an, almost an order of magnitude stronger interactions between individual molecules here. And so you have all these intermolecular interactions and really an amazing thing about water is that if you think about the, the, the hydrogen bond between two waters and then you look at the hydrogen bond between three waters and you ask the question, let's say, for instance, you measure hydrogen, hyd the hydrogen bond between two waters is 50 kilojoules per mole. Right? So you would expect if you have three waters, which has three hydrogen bonds, that it would be 150 kilojoules per mole, because right? you have three of them. But in fact, when you measure the binding energy of three waters, um, you end up getting an extra amount of energy. It ends up being about 170 kilojoules per mole. So water has what are called three multi-body interactions. The more waters you put together, the stronger the hydrogen bonds get. Right? So when you have these weird multi-body effects where the, the interaction of five, hydrogen, uh, high, five waters hydrogen bond to themselves, is, the strength of that is greater than the sum of its parts. And then you have these, inter these strange interactions and high pressure, you get really, really weird things happening. Because right? you have multiple degrees of freedom for the system to relax in, to distribute the energy through these hydrogen bonds across the networks and within the networks, and so you get these really crazy structures. Okay, um, let's see if I have any more pretty pictures for you. I don't think I do. Uh, I, no, you wanna look at some? Here, let's just look it up. Let's see if we can find some cubic snowflakes, actually. I've never looked for that before. Cubic snowflakes of water. I don't think anyone's ever made them before. No, maybe not. But I, I would assume that I would assume that a, a, a cubic ice snowflake 
would look a lot like this, but instead it only has four, four, four vertices. Right? And instead of, having, instead of having a tessellated hexagonal pattern, you would have a tessellated square pattern. I don't think anyone's ever made one before. Can we make one? Yeah, if you can figure out how to do it, yeah, by all means. Okay. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Okay, let me get the exam out for you guys. So I just want to make a quick comment as I distribute this. Um, please read the front page and sign and date it. If you don't, I won't give you any points. Um, my, the, the assumption is the only rule on this exam, I'm sorry, I'm getting spam calls. Um, the only assumption on this or requirement on this exam is that you cannot collaborate on it. Um, so that's all I ask you to sign. Um, I, I work on the assumption of honor, not the assumption of dishonor, so I'm not going to ask for anything else other than that. Um, I don't, you guys are all upperclassmen. I don't think anyone's going to shoot this class. And also, I don't think cheating on this exam is going to help find anything. I try to make, I, I kind of want to make uh, the exams, I don't, think, I, don't think, I don't think you get much incentive for wanting to cheat on this exam. So, I give you enough opportunity to do things on your own. And, uh, you can use any resources you'd like. Does everyone have an exam? Okay. I'm missing a couple. All right. All right, guys. Have a lovely weekend. Um, again, feel free to send me emails if you have questions about the exam. If you look at it this weekend, it is due back at the, end, the beginning of class on Thursday. Can I write pretty notes on it? Write any notes on it? Yeah. Like apologies and things like that? Yeah, so, yeah sure, of course. Yeah. If, we need if you want to write me, then, what? If we need more paper for it, would you rather line paper? Uh, I don't know what you, what was your question? If you need more if, paper? If we need more scratch work area like 30 minutes. than this? Oh, well, just, just, just attach some notebook paper to it or whatever. That's fine, yeah. Some pieces, like, you must use a picture paper. No, I don't, no, I don't give two craps about that. Jeez, Louise. Like that on yeah, only, oh, yeah, only, yeah, only, only unlined paper number two pencils, please. Have you ever, I've never seen a number three. Yeah, I have. I have a question. I wanted to ask you. Um, so clearly, you must be going through next semester is looking kind of awful. I'm just wondering, like, how, 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 Terrible would be if I ended up taking um, physical chemistry to the next stage. Um, I don't think they offer it in the fall. No, it's only a spring course. Exactly. Um, so you're here in the next spring now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, That's totally okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, the, the material in the material in PCM2 is more or less independent from PCM1. Okay. So, in fact, we have a couple students in, in these two sections who took PCM2 in the last semester. So, if you want to take a year off, that's totally okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. I'm looking at four lab courses next semester. Oh, jeez. Yeah. 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 By by all means, take it when you're comfortable taking it. It's not a big deal. You're welcome. Forensic students on their last two semesters. Can't yeah. do that. I, I, yeah. Uh...